Yes, I know. Okay, so this is gonna, I'm gonna start with a bit about the null alternative hypothesis. So um, I'll probably do like a quick little like doc about the formulas or probably a PDF because I hate having to search around for the doc stuff in Word. Um, so when we talk about null and alternative hypothesis, what you're doing is uh, you're trying to mathematically prove something that you don't want to happen. So if I am running, the, the, the lecture we're going to do is on hypothesis testing for one sample. This will work for two sample, ANOVA, whatever you're doing. Proportions, it's all the same basic thing. A null hypothesis is what you don't want to be. So a null hypothesis. Is a symbol um, H not. Is essentially like that that state of I don't want this to happen. I am trying my best in my test to prove this isn't real. This isn't what I have in my data set. The alternative hypothesis. H of A is in English what I want. This is the state of being of what I want from my test. To set this up, you do H naught, you set your mean equal to some value. I'm choosing 60 randomly. My null hypothesis, so let's say I'm uh, trying to say the number of home runs hit in the 2000s for the top player was 60 home runs. And I'm going to set the alternative hypothesis, the one I'm trying to prove, is that it's higher than that. Because I want to say that, hey, that was the juice error, right? I want to prove there's more home runs hit in that era. So my alternative hypothesis, HA, would be that my mean is greater than the 60. So I don't want to prove that I have 60 home runs. What I'm trying to prove is I have more than 60 runs. However, you don't prove anything. When you write your words, you do not say you prove anything. All you can do is reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. So fail to, you fail to reject. That means my data is not far enough away from 60 for things to work. If I reject my null hypothesis, that means all I'm left with is 60. So you're proving it by disproving everything else. If all I have left is my alternative hypothesis, I can't say it's true, but I can wink suggestively at its area. I have more than 60. So I reject or I fail to reject the null hypothesis. So we'll get into that a little bit more in it. Yes. Use depends on the question. So this is where it gets kind of weird. You could set your null hypothesis to be whatever you want it to be. I said that the null that my null hypothesis is people hit 60 home runs. I could say they hit less than 60. I could say that's the cap. It depends on how you ask. 100% how you ask. So depends. Uh, that's where it gets kind of weird, and that's why it's very important the words that you use for what tests you run, what p values, what z values, everything. Because if you set it up 
to be this or that, you're changing it from one tail to two tails. You can even switch to one tail by doing that. If I make it not equal to, it's instantly a two tail. If I switch the sign, I switch the tail. Everything is dependent on you and how you ask the question. What you should not do, and this has nothing to do with the project, but everything about how you're supposed to run statistics is say, well, this didn't work, so I'm gonna try this because it was really close. No, that is literally what you should never do. Pick a test, run it, report your findings. You could talk about, because I ran this as a two-tailed test, I didn't quite meet the threshold for rejecting the null hypothesis. However, looking at it, if I would have run it as a one-tail, it might have done it. But you cannot claim it did. But you're at least telling the truth. Because of how I asked the question, it did. Let people make their own conclusions from that. So does that help you guys with the project coming up in English, basically? If nothing else, that will help with getting the, the, the big part of the rubric about the mathematical symbols, right? And the reject, fail to reject, and all that nonsense. If you have any help, need any help, bug me. I can correct all that. So on to the lecture, which we'll go back into this a bit. Um, so we're doing tests of single samples. So this is, we're looking at uh, sample populations and we're testing against a known mean, essentially is what we're looking at. All that nonsense, yeah. So kind of what I just went over. A statistical hypothesis is where we're looking to see if something is significantly different from a known value. You usually do one sample test when you're trying, when you have an industry norm. So if you're running, if you're running, uh, what would be a good example? Uh, recycle, oh, let's go back to the, the first problem that they had for like the whole thing. Recycle time for uh, flashes. If there is an industry set time for how long you should have a recycle time, you could see, is my camera performing better than, worse than, or different than what they set for? Once again, everything depends on how you ask for it. Uh, so here's the H naught. So if you have equals, or the, your H naught, like I said, it depends on how you ask the question. Um, is Am I looking for something to be equal to or less than? Uh, generally speaking, you set the alternative or the null hypothesis to be equal to. That is generally speaking the best practices. Um, so null alternative here. Uh, but how you set this will determine what you're doing. So um, be careful. Like Two and one right. I think I'm going to use backwards because it's not easy to have on number. And I just like to copy it. But when you're doing this, specifically when you're looking at critical speed values, what you can do. Um, what? Critical speed test? It can be critical speed, it can be the V, it can be the Chalmers, it can be the Rodney. I'm just doing the V as a generic thing, but this is just typical. Everybody This is specifically for V values, but you can set it up when you're critical, when you set this up. Uh, 1.68, 2.68, you can set it up So, 
you can set your critical D values or whatever it is, look it up to base off of it, say it's three one. Set up the target plus two values and go. Um, this is a very effective way to make sure that your log is wrong. Like I said, I'll double check on this, make sure I'm doing it to the left or the right. Just have to make sure, I mean, just let me check real quick. So if I'm looking for something that's left, that's then. Yes, that's right. Because if I'm looking for less, it'll be done this left side of this. If I'm looking for something greater, it's going to be this side of this. Um, so yeah, I did it right. Yes. I'm, I don't remember. I was just trying to pull the numbers out. Those are the critical values. So you go to the Z table or the T table or whatever you're using for your significant level or whatever for homework, for your project, whatever. And you put in, like if this is 95, you put in 95, 95, 97. So that if you're doing these by hand or make it a function to do it, you have these values changed. And then as you change this, you can see it whenever you look at the numbers over here or the symbols over there, you know which one to apply. You see it, it's there, it's easy enough to plug in what you want. But remember, when you do this one, if you do the one here, plus, sorry, I forgot that. That negative sign matters because we're looking at the left side of the distribution, right? So that's a negative number. So um, after that, we will. You know, you, you're trying to test it. You draw a sample. We get the data, however you're gonna get the table, data, and we have to, well, we're supposed to look at specific things, but um, uh, this last part bugs me. You do not prove anything is true or false. You can reject or you cannot reject. So they're oversimplifying it based, and this is what it bugs me because you're, you've done how much math classes, right? You shouldn't have it dumbed down. You should be able to understand inference by rejection, right? You reject it, it goes away. If you fail to reject it, that's what you have left. Simple proof, really simple proof. So ignore that last little bit. This. Uh, yeah, we don't prove truth. We don't we can only prove that something doesn't exist. We can only prove the false. Okay. So once again, this is where thought process comes in. This is where this table over here I make comes in. Look at the symbol for your alternative hypothesis. And from that, you choose the number of tails. Is it a one-tailed left, one-tailed right, or two-tailed? Am I doing a negative number, positive number, or both sides at half the alpha? That's what you're looking at. In this case, we have a not equal, easiest one to do, because it's a two-tailed. You don't have to guess, have to, have to second guess whether you have a positive or negative number. It's the easiest. Uh, so you're looking both ends of this. This is gonna let me write. Hate red. So on here, it's not going. I don't know why it stopped doing that. Uh, so two-tailed test. So it's looking at both sides. If you go past, what we're doing is we're setting a critical value. Uh, so just like we found the 95% confidence intervals, we know very specific numbers where we're going to be different than what we expect from the mean. That's what we're doing. So just like we did for the, you know, 95% confidence interval. If it falls into that area, we know it's going to be different. And that's where this comes into. So this is important because people are going to say, I don't believe you, or what's your level of confidence in this? Uh, so this is the thing that I always get backwards. Just my life. So this is a type one and type two error. A type one error is your alpha. So the number you're looking up 
on your Z table, your T table, whatever. That is your alpha. That's your power of your statistical test. Uh, this is type one error right here. When you reject your null hypothesis when it's true. Uh, the reason we do this, um, so anybody see the big news yesterday about Pfizer putting out the vaccine, right? They want really, really, really small power. They would rather reject absolutely everything that could possibly be bad and leave only the good. So your alpha here will be a very small number. And that's okay. Because they'd rather fail to reject something, rather not fail to reject something, that's gonna harm you. They want everything that could harm people thrown out. They don't care. So they wanna be 100% sure that this is going to work and 90% of people. So type one is when I want to make sure, I want a low type one error when I wanna make sure people are safe. I want a high type one when I wanna make sure that I have, um, I just realized that's probably what's causing me to be muted on uh, YouTube. I want a high type two error when I'm okay with some errors, but I just wanna make sure that everything is true gets modified as true. Um, and alpha and beta, uh, type one and type two, beta is just one minus your alpha, which makes sense. It's kind of two sides of the one thing. Um, so the type one is, sometimes it is, it is a significant thing. So if I have, if anybody ever, if they ever ask you what your type one error, it's just alpha. Um, so that's a kind of a weird, this is like the whole weird subjective thing. Uh, it's gonna be the one that's gonna be kind of weird to talk about, but it's important because this is, you know, what field are you on? What level are you okay with? Things not working the way they're not gonna, supposed to work. Your error, you know, that's what the type one and type two is about. Yes, because usually if you, well, think of this. If I have a low type one or a high type one, I'm letting in a lot of things that should not happen in. So I want really low significance. I want really low significance. I want to make sure what I get is actually different. Um, so that's why the industry standard is about 0.05 or just about everyone. Uh, no one's doing biomedical engineering or anything weird like that. Other than you're sorry, you're like 99.9, .9, right? Uh, unless you're doing some weird stuff that you haven't gotten into. Um, if you're if you're gonna run Bonferroni, let me know, um, and then you can go up to 95. Uh, if you want to look into that, if not, just do 99.9, same thing. But if you want to look into that and run that, you're free to go to 95. Bonferroni corrections. Specifically, not a Bonferroni test, a Bonferroni correction, which is different. Uh, are you running in MATLAB or R? Okay, I don't know if it's in MATLAB or not, but I do know it's in R. You can always find the formula. It's there. It just adjusts your p-value given, because usually if you're running bioinformatics or stuff like that, you're going to be running like huge data sets. And you'll see in a little bit, numbers can be so big that it's going to change how you look at numbers, you're gonna get significance and you're not gonna trust it. So you correct for the large data sets with this mathematical formula. I've, if you can't find it, let me know. I have it in the book somewhere on the internet and I could just grab you the, get, get the formula for you. Bonferroni correction. It is an R, so worst case scenario, you can like get your p-values. Uh, and you can run it through R um, if you're interested. Otherwise, if it gets too much of a pass, I'll just keep your 99.9. .9. Um, but it's something you should be aware of going into that. Uh, so probability for doing this is the same as probability for everything else. You take you know, the difference between uh, your 48 and 50 divided by 0.79. Where's 0.79 here? 
did they get 0.79? Oh, that's just, they're running it through. Wait, they, this is the bottom part of your data set. They don't tell you it, but that's the bottom part of your data set um, to get your Z value. So whenever you correct it, if you want to find the probability of each side, you just run a Z test for the low end and the high end. You, this is calculating your uh, critical Z scores. So if you're below these points, you're going to be significant. Um, so this is how they calculate the value. You could do it this way. You can make 95% confidence intervals and see if it falls outside of it. Both of them work. Um, so this implies that about 5.7% of all random samples would lead to rejection of the null hypothesis because they would fall outside of it. Not quite what we want. We actually want that 0.5. So you need slightly bigger windows. Um, if we change it to 52 instead of 50, we have negative 4.43 and negative 0.63. Uh, that changes a lot of things because if our normal mean is 52% and we're checking to see how many are over 51.5, a lot of data is going to be over 51.5 because 52 is our normal mean. So we're going to have really high um, reject or fail to reject null hypothesis because our normal mean falls outside of what we're looking at here. So we go up from 5 to 26%. So this is how you do the type one and type two error. I've never, once again, in real life, you might have to do it in Wiley. You don't really do this. Um, somebody may, and the ones in a blue moon, ask you for it. I've, like, I've done like five or six publications with this, and they never asked me for it once. So your results may vary. It probably doesn't happen. Um, so power. I'm so glad they have this in here because this is the thing that's probably going to save your sanity, especially if you're doing stuff with big numbers. So <clears throat> we can essentially figure out how big a, a sample size should be and the power of a test based on some basic math. Uh, so power is calculated as one minus beta. So power is alpha. Um, the probability of correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis. So alpha is power. We set our power equal to what we expect in the industry. Uh, so if you, this is propellant burning uh, rate problem where we tested uh, null uh, mean is equal to 50 centimeters per second against not 50 centimeters per second. Uh, if the true value of the mean is 52, if we have 10, we found that beta of 0.2643. So the power of the test is 0.7357. So if we know our beta, we can test the power. So the probability is of, of correctly rejecting a false null hypothesis is about 74-ish percent, which we like. That's, you know, not bad. Not the greatest, but not bad. So these are two-sided tests and one-sided tests. Kind of went over that before, right? So two-sided test, really easy to see. Has the has the not with the alternative. The one-sided test where your mean is greater than or less than a known mean or given value. Uh, so when you have a one-sided hypothesis, rejecting that null hypothesis is a strong conclusion. It is better if you are looking at tests. This is why I said it's important to ask the correct question. If you ask the correct question, you have a stronger chance of having the, of doing that because one-sided test, we have a larger rejection area. So if you ask the right question, you have a better chance of rejecting a null hypothesis. If you're looking for differences, you're gonna have a smaller chance because you have smaller windows. <coughs> um, so everything is based on a point of view. So, if you want to have a higher chance of rejecting, think of the proper question. If you want 
a lower chance. Because remember, you don't always want to reject the null hypothesis. If I'm looking at, for instance, um, do I fall within specs for uh, contaminations of lead in the water versus am I over specs for, rent for parts per billion of lead in water? Are two completely different questions and they're both valid. So which one do you want? If it's a report to somebody up high, you may want the two tail. If it's a internal memo, we need to get this taken care of now, you may want the other one because then it shows that, hey, this is a problem, we need it fixed because we don't want uh, EPA here. Or, hey, we need to get this done because it's going to be an issue now, I'd rather get it done with quickly. <clears throat> Although no one usually cares about the flow of lead, but companies may. Companies may say, we have this, we should be using it as a resource, not making judgments. I don't particularly agree with it, but companies are companies. They want to know high or low in that given situation. Um, like I said, not a big fan of it personally. But. So p-value is the smallest level of significance that would lead to rejection of the null hypothesis with our data. In English, if we are below our power that we have, so that alpha value, we would reject it. So the, if your p-value is below your alpha, you would reject the null hypothesis. So that is the observed significant level. No, not the power, sorry, it's the alpha, it's the alpha. It is, one, it is if your p-value is below your alpha, you would reject the null hypothesis. So the p-value has to be below alpha. It's below alpha, yes. Unless you have calculated specifically your beta, if you're going off of assumed normality of 0 0.05, 0 0.95 for alpha and beta, then it would be. If you have calculated your chance, then it's differently. So it really depends are you looking at theoretical versus actual. So that's why it, it's kind of hard. That's why I corrected myself because P value looks after your alpha, not in this, your power can be your alpha, depending on how you're looking at it. It gets kind of confusing. So, so to simplify, alpha p-value. Below your p-value, or your alpha on your p-value, at or below, you'd reject it. The only problem with this is this leads to something called p-hacking. Um, what ends up happening is everyone will throw the kitchen sink at your data to find something significant. You're going to change your sample size. You're going to change what you're looking at and everything. You're, you'll do a two-tail test and change it to one-tail test, one-tail test, change it to the other side in order to find significant differences. You're not supposed to do that. You have the question. You run the test. You report it. If you think it might be high or you might be low, you could do that. There's no saying what your research question is, except you. If you think, I'm thinking that it might be high, but there's an equal chance of it being low, then do that. that as, but it has to be two separate research questions. So what are, like for instance, if I'm looking at, let's go back to the parts per billion. Let's talk about the, that lead in the water. If I'm saying we've had an increased production in, in our facility, which could possibly lead to high lead levels. So that's one alternative, null and alternative hypothesis. However, at the same time, we've introduced a new remediation program, which should lower it. That's another one. So the first one is, has our increased production increased our lead levels? The second one is, has our remediation pro process lowered our lead levels. Two different questions with the same data. If you phrase it right, you can run both.
but you have to phrase it right. But you have to do that before you even look at data. Ethically, you're supposed to ask the question because you can't just change your mind. And I tell people, there's no one who says, other than your PI, what your question is. And a good PI says, I want you to state every single possible one and, and write about it in order to make sure we have the best probability of getting a null hypothesis rejected. So there's ways around P hacking that are not necessarily the best ways that can work. But you have, you have to go into it knowing that. You're not supposed to change it in the middle of what you're doing. Whether that's ethical, that's another question. I personally don't do that, but you can, and it would hurt my soul a little, but you can do it. So a p-value in a hypothesis test. So if we had this here, um, um, null of 50 against the not 50 with uh, 16 sample size and 2.5 standard deviation, and we have an observed mean of 51.3. So what we do, we would just essentially plug that into the Z formula. Well, what you're doing is you're calculating Z formulas. So you calculate the Z value for the left and right. So the probability between negative two and two. So one minus that is 0 0.038. You have to be honest though, there are statistical programs you just plug it in. <clears throat> but that being said, this is to look at specifically the p-value. Um, the thing about it is, and here's the wonderful thing, can you run a z-test using this data here? Yeah. You have a standard deviation, you have a mean, you have a mean that you're checking against here. You have a sample size. Instead of doing this part right here, you can plug those into a Z table or score, get your Z value, and then go to the table and see if it's what significant level you're at. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. There are ways around it. So uh, a uh, close relationship exists between the no, test for hypothesis for the sigma and the confidence. So a test for significance is your essentially your confidence interval. So if I have a known confidence interval and I have a test mean, I can see whether it falls outside of my confidence interval. Um, so if LU is 100 minus, or times one minus alpha, uh, the confidence interval for the parameter uh, is set as equal and not equal. So it's the same thing. Um, in English, <clears throat> if I have a confidence interval and I run my true mean and it falls within that 95%, so if I find the, the confidence intervals for I'm, you're writing and all of a sudden to write this down. So if I calculate my, my means right here, and I make my confidence intervals right here and right here, and my true mean falls to right here, I can reject. If it falls outside of my confidence interval, I can reject it. So you remember how I was doing those box plots? And if you remember correctly, about 1.5 IQR is really for deviations, which is about 95% of your data. So on a box plot, nice little cheaty way to do this without doing it. If I have a box plot, one of the reasons I said to do these are tests, and they look something like this, There's a very, very good chance because it's really close that they'll be significantly different because there's a gap right there. Because the same thing that applies for that normal distribution of one 
SD to SD. So remember the 68, 99.75. Usually how far away you are from your mean. So there are there are ways to check without even doing the math whether I'm going to be significantly different. So like for instance, this one, standard deviation of 2.5, 50, 51.3. Uh, I don't think I would personally reject it. Just looking at it. But even then, it's one of those things I know instantly or not instantly, whether or not it'd be something I would reject. Wait, how did they? Yeah, this one they have a they have a p value, and I don't know how. That makes no sense. Because if you have a mean of fifty and a standard deviation of two point five. That's within one standard deviation of your mean. That doesn't make sense. Two point five times divided by four. Sorry, this doesn't. This really doesn't make sense. Uh, calculator. Calculator. One six two five. So it's 1.3. Yeah, that's right. 2.8, negative 2.8. Yeah, that makes sense, but it just doesn't make sense to me. Fifty, forty-eight point seven, fifty-one 51.3. Oh. I see because of the sample size I'm used to dealing with different slightly different numbers with the sample size the sample size here actually makes this number much smaller. So if you something later so based on this, this will shrink the standard deviation difference and will create a different amount right here that's why. Something later. Uh, so generally uh, here's a little cheat sheet uh, find the problem. That's the first thing. Always state the problem the correct way to get yourself what you want. Write the null hypothesis, word and letter and mathematical symbols. Um, and the alternative hypothesis. This is the important one. The null hypothesis is usually going to be equal, not always, but usually equal. The alternative should be what you are looking for. Determine which test you're running for. Uh, Z tests are always good. Uh, because Z is kind of unitless, but it depends on what you're looking at specifically. Um, you can also run F test, T test, Chi squared, uh, Wilcoxon ranked, uh, all kinds of nonsense. Uh, so you reject it, your null hypothesis if your p value is below your alpha or if you fall within the rejection of area of your Z scores. Uh, so you make any do any maths that you are forced to do or use a computer to not do maths up to you <clears throat> and draw your conclusions. This is where it's important. What does it mean? So, yes, I reject the null hypothesis. What does that mean? Um, so should the null hypothesis be rejected? Should it not be rejected? And if I reject it, what does that mean for my data? So if I was doing the baseball example and I rejected the null hypothesis, that means, yeah, people are hitting more home runs than 60 a year. If I have it as different, did I prove that people hit more than 60 home runs? Or did I prove that they didn't hit 60? So your answer and how you talk about it depends on your, your alternative hypothesis. What did I have? And then I could talk about it in that context. You can say you hit more because, and here's the important part about hypothesis testing. You have to report your mean, and I would highly suggest reporting your standard deviation because that tells me and allows you to say if it's higher or lower. Because if it's a higher value and you reject it, it doesn't matter if it's a two-tailed test. 
you showed that it's significantly different on a two tail and your mean was higher than your hypothesized mean. It doesn't matter. You can talk about it that way. So just because you choose the wrong test, you still get a, a significant difference. You could talk about something's bigger. You could talk about it being lower because you have that data. No one has ever told you you can't report means and standard deviations. That's normal. So talk about it and use that for the context. Use that for the talking and the writing. Uh, so Z score statistic, we've done that. Ugh, so small. Um, literally what I just said. So, <clears throat> so I love some of these questions because they're so. So, an air group escape systems are powered by a solid propellant. Great to think about if you're flying. Uh, the burning rate of this propellant is important because of, well, you know, physics. You don't want to go too fast. You don't want to go too slow. You want to get away at just the right speed so that you don't break necks and you don't die in a horrendous crash, you know, stuff like that. So our specifications require that the mean burning rate be 50 centimeters per second and the standard deviation is two centimeters per second. We have an alpha of 0.05. I personally want an alpha of 0.01 if it's my life but whatever, uh, and a random sample of 25 has a sample average burning rate of centimeters per second. So we have our, what we're looking at, which is the mean of the burning rate. We have a null hypothesis that it's at 50 centimeters per second, which is what we need. And we have an alternative hypothesis that it's not. So when you're looking at specifications, a lot of the times you're going to run a two-tailed test because you want to make sure that it's not any above or below what's important. And here's where it's fun. Yeah. Generally, yes. But in this case, you do. So it's all dependent on the question. A majority of what you'll be doing is not. But you have, you caught it really quick. You have to think about it. I don't want to reject the null hypothesis here because it's specs. Usually, a lot of the times, this type of question will be based on specifications. I want to show that it's not off spec. So I want to fail to reject the null hypothesis when you're going against a standard and you want to meet that standard. Unless it's okay to be better than the standard. So if it's a safety issue, you want to be right on because too fast, too slow can be deadly. If, however, you're looking at like, if anybody's a transportation engineer or something like that, on-time delivery, oh yeah, I want to be higher than the standard. I want to be as high as I possibly can. That's, that's a legitimate thing. It just depends on how you ask the question, how the question is stated. Health and safety, it's OSHA stuff. It's usually a you meet spec. You want to meet spec, you don't want to get higher or lower because OSHA man is not a nice man for fines. Oh no, my, my uh, university's chemistry department got a $3 million fine. You don't want OSHA fines. And they're, they were arguing if it's the physical plant who didn't actually listen to the chemist who said, no, your chemical wash stations should not drain into the general water. Versus the physical plant and says, well, we just built like we we're told to. So that's a fun, fun argument. I'm glad I'm not part of. But that's why you keep OSHA off of you, because legitimately a $3 million fine for somebody not following engineers' plans, which probably stated that no, you don't drain chemical waste into water. So we have a test statistic of a z-score. Uh, we would reject null hypothesis if your p-value is less than 0.05. So the boundaries of the critical region would be the z of alpha 0.025 or plus or minus 1.96. So you could just set the critical z-score. So if you have this and you calculate that, if you're above or below it, you reject it. Or you could do the other part where you're calculating the power, or the, the p-value. It's up to you. I personally like using this one because it's less math. 
Um, but you know, your homework's gonna make you do what the homework's gonna make you do. Sorry. But a lot of times, here's the fun thing. They'll let you look up your P, your P value based off of your Z score. There's the programs let you do that. Uh, so this calculates to be 3.25. That's not good, uh, <laughs> which means I would reject my null hypothesis. There, so that would mean <clears throat> my alternative hypothesis that the rate is not 50. And if I look at the means, I have, what was the other mean? Did it actually give me the mean? It 51.3, they didn't tell me the mean on this. So if I see that my mean is 51.3, that's gonna be significantly different from mine. Um, so that means the rates differ from 50 centimeters per second based on the sample of 25 people. So the important thing to realize here is if you play around with the number here, you can change this. Um, so there's a whole field of statistics on how big my sample size should be to detect at a specific amount. Uh, which if we have, we'll have time at the end of this uh, end of the semester, I'll talk about it. I'll pull those formulas up because it's really important for stuff like this. You want to have a big enough sample size to be able to tell if something's different, but not too big. Because then you're going to find everything. Uh, so find the probability type two error. If you really want to do the expected value of X minus your mean over your standard deviation times the square root. You just change it to your expected value instead of your known value and calculate it out. So probability is theta times your Z score alpha over two times uh, sigma square root of N over your standard deviation. So if I'm looking at a two-sided test, Z alpha divided by two plus Z beta squared, sigma squared over X. Where this is just your difference between your mean and your X value. So the main difference is between one and two tail is this, am I looking at alpha or alpha over two, but you take your alpha plus your beta or alpha divided by two plus your beta squared times your standard deviation squared. Once again, I've never really truly had to do this, um, but if you have to, or more likely for your homework, uh, this is not something that's done normally in statistics. I've never sat in a conference and said, what's your chance of having a type two error? I just never have. Um, and I was, I hate to say it, you know that guy at conferences when you had to talk that always comes up with the obvious thing that you did wrong? Sorry, guys. I truly am sorry, but it's just one of those things where I, I needed to get better at stats. And the best way to get better at stats is to, especially for teaching, right? I need to know what you're thinking. So you, I need you to go through your thought process. And the best way to do that is to poke holes at people. It's not malicious, I swear, <laughs> but it helps. Um, I just learned to be nicer about it as grad school went on. So um, the rocket propellant example 9.2, if we have a true burning rate of 49 centimeters per second, the beta for the two-sided test with alpha 0.05 and everything else. So we would have a difference of one, right? 50 minus 49. Uh, alpha divided by two of 1.96. So 1.96 minus 25 over your standard deviation. And then you take the negative. So you have negative 0.54 uh, and 4.46, so which give us 2.95. So we have about 30% chance to fail. Uh, we'll fail to reject the null hypothesis when it's true, burning, burning at 49 centimeters per second. If we change this number, once again, we'll change a lot of things within the problem. 
So it's reasonable, not great. So power 0.7, we don't really truly like. We would like to see that a little higher. Um, generally speaking, the higher we can get that up, the more people will believe our results. Uh, specifically, when you're talking about health and safety, we want to see 0 0.8, 0 0.9, something like that, when we're actually looking at true numbers and not hypothesized numbers. Um, so, if we want to find, this is actually, um, if we want to, this is the level of determination. So, this is actually the power stuff. If we want to design a test so that the true mean will differ from 50 centimeters per second as much as one centimeter per second. So we're looking for the amount of detection for one point, which is important. We can basically re rework the formula to be this. So alpha and beta is up here, 1.96 plus 1.28 uh, squared. So we could calculate that based off of alpha, right? This is just plugged in, there's like, if you were running this in a program, there's, and you actually have this program, there's a huge list of things you can just do. Wow. Um, I'm about done with class because we're about done with class. Sorry, guys. Uh, I could have this stored as a general formula, and we could, if we do the standard deviation and the difference, because that's what we're looking for is the difference here, we could determine our sample size. And that's important because then we can figure out how big or small we want to we need a sample size to determine the difference at that point. So this is the holy grail of when you're looking at determining differences. So when you're trying to figure out how big of a sample size you need, this is what you look at. And like I said, this is this will be calculated for you if you're running it on a computer, because this is just stuff you looked up. You plug in your alpha, and it gives you the alpha divided by two, and your beta is just that as well you'll put in your standard deviation and find your difference. Plug it all in and go. Um, and once again, this is number, make sure that's rounded. Um, unfortunately, I'm at 23 side. So because of this, the bigger we get with our sample size, the smaller or the more likely we are to reject the null hypothesis. We want to control the sample size as much as possible in order to keep it a level of detection that makes sense. Um, so most practical situations, our sigma squared will be unknown. Uh, even uh, we may, then, we may not be certain of the population is normally distributed. So we want to. We're trying to like go between a large enough population size, find believable results, while at the same time having uh, one small enough to be able to detect to be believable at the same time be able to detect differences so it's a weird like kind of balancing game for p for t test p test z test all that nonsense if you're trying to build models so if you're in the realm of like huge statistical models and you're trying to build what's best you don't care about a specific sample size you want as much data as possible if i have enough data I have enough to build something to show people. So that's, this is only for t-test and p-test. You wanna kind of manipulate your, not manipulate, to obtain the right amount of sample size. Anything, any other thing, then you want more because you don't care about the p-test, p-value. You care about what's within the model. You care about the effects within it, not the effect that's significant because yeah, of course it's gonna be significant, but what does each variable within that model mean to my data? Uh, so once again, you can do a t-test instead. <clears throat> so it is currently, when are we supposed to go to? 6.30, so. Uh, this is, so we can, instead of a t-test, uh, a z-test, you can do a t-test, just depends on if you have the s instead of the sigma, it's the same basic thing. Uh, so once again, we have a bunch of data. So we need to see, uh, experiment was performed which 15 drivers produce a particular cub, uh, by a pub maker, 
were selected at random and the coefficients of restitution measured. Uh, it is of interest to determine if there's evidence. <coughs> so this is standard uh, manufacturing, so 0.05 is fine. To support the claim that the mean of coefficient of the restitution exceeds 0.82. So that's our hypothesized mean. <clears throat> we can find our mean and, and S from here. So 0.8375 and 0.02456, pretty small. <clears throat> so we're looking to see if it's great, it's uh, exceeds. So remember on here, when you do this, we're back to word problems. Sorry, guys. In there, exceeds, greater than, less than, less than, not, is not, is not equal to. So you have to go back through here <clears throat> and read it like a word problem and just do the mathematical symbols. So in this case, the null hypothesis is it's equal to that 0.82 with the alternative that it's greater than. We could care less if it's less than because this is something that, you know, we're okay with it being less. We don't want a greater. <clears throat> Run the test statistic. We have a test statistic here. Mean minus your hypothesized mean over S over square root of N. And we reject if our p-value is less than 0 0.05. Or we can go to the t-table test and do the same thing. So since X is 0.8375, so the difference between that and our mean, over S over square root of 15 <clears throat> gives us a 2.7. Something that high, very good chance you're going to reject the null hypothesis. And so if you go to the t-table, degrees of freedom is 2.72. So it's literally a point, uh, falls between 2.642, so which is alpha 0 0.01. So since it's less than 0 0.01, you, you could technically look up this, but our p-value is going to be between those two. <clears throat> this is a, you would reject the null hypothesis. And this is when, if Wiley does this to you, I apologize. Once again, not my favorite program at times, or a lot of times. In reality, you would never have to know the individual p-value for a t-test. You just need to know if you reject it or fail to reject it. If it asks you to reject it, ah, sorry. Um, so, but since it's less than 0 0.05, you reject it, which means that the mean, uh, strong evidence to conclude that the mean coefficient of resolution exceeds 0 0.8. So because we failed to reject it, leaving the alternative, the mean of this coefficient is going to, should be higher than 0 0.82. Um, Remember, I do the kiss thing. You don't have to use big fancy words. Just tell me. Because I rejected, it's going to be higher. You had to say that you don't say you proved it, but you say because I rejected the null hypothesis, leading the alternative, the mean of the coefficients is going to be higher than the expected mean. Uh, so this is how you would look this up. Uh, so same thing, mean minus your differences of the mean versus hypothesize over your standard deviation. Pretty easy to look up. And then you'd go to wonderful charts. You don't necessarily have to use their charts. You can look up the same thing, but easier to read. I don't care. For the quiz next week, if you really want to just print out the Z table, T table, and all these charts, go for it. I will let you have them. So you don't have to look them up on the computer because it's pointless. Or if you even have them as a PDF, I don't really care. Because I know those charts that they have there are annoying to pull up and hard to read. So have at it. Oh, da, 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 da. So I'm going to stop here. I'm going to record the next one so you guys don't miss any content. Uh, what you're going to miss, I'll just go over it real quick. Uh, Test on variance, which is a uh, chi-squared test, lets you see if your variance is different from one group to the next. Uh, so it runs kind of the same thing, very basic, easy mathematical formula. Um, do, 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 do. Uh, we're going to go over proportion testing. So 
So if you're looking at proportions, it's kind of the same thing where we're looking at number of times your proportion, um, large sample sizes, uh, and the goodness of fit. Uh, if you've ever taken an AP, high level AP science course or stuff like that, you've done a chi squared where you have a, oh, observed versus expected. If you need help with that, I actually have on my YouTube channel, the M&M chi squared test. Uh, and then you can say you're doing homework and go get M&Ms and eat them because it will run through that problem. Uh, what you expect versus what you have, it's kind of cool. And then you can eat your M&Ms when you're done. The col observed versus expected colors of an M&M pack and each one will be different. I love running that for high school students because then they get to eat M&Ms at the end of the lab. Um, contingency test, which is what that is. Non-parametric, which whatever, and Will Cox and signal rank test and equivalent testing. So there's like five or six. So I will make a video. Don't worry. I will share it. Uh, so.